Hey, Uncle Chao. Um, just wondering, what do you think about Tony walking down Khabib? I think Tony's just going to come forward and not care about getting taken down, and you've never seen Khabib on his back foot. Um, it's going to be a very interesting fight. Uh, what are your thoughts? Thanks. I like that. I think that you got influenced by that question through an interview that Eddie Bravo just did. And if I'm wrong about that, well, Eddie Bravo, who trains Tony Ferguson, said, look, I don't want to give too much of the strategy away, but we're going to walk him down. We're coming forward and we're coming at him. And I will tell you, that was music to my ears. Because when I do sit down and, and break Khabib down, that is one of the biggest things that no opponent does. No opponent stands their ground or walks down Khabib. They're always backing up. And I don't, whatever Khabib does to create that pressure to make you want to keep on backing up until your back finally hits the fence, good for Khabib. I've never fully been able to isolate it. People will chalk it up to, oh, he, he's such a good wrestler. People will chalk it up to, well, he keeps such a pace on you. Maybe it is as simple as that. But I have watched it over and over and over again. Why can Khabib always go forward? How come nobody can stand their ground? How come nobody can pressure into Khabib? And if this is Tony's plan, if this is Coach Eddie Bravo's plan, whether it works out or not, just hearing that the guys have at least established, this is the mistake that other fighters have made. And here's a mistake that we're not going to let happen. Now, I understand it's a two-man sport, and just because you've identified it doesn't mean you can necessarily go out and stop it. But just hearing Eddie Bravo say, we are not getting walked down by this guy. We will stand our ground or we will gain ground. Just to hear the fact that Team Tony has identified this, is working on it, and plans to do it, to me as a viewer, that is literally music to my ears. What's going on, Uncle Chell? Big fan. Just want to pick your brain for a second. So if Cowboy were to beat Connor, which is a definite possibility because he has the tools to pull off an upset, do you think that public opinion might change about Connor McGregor and people might see him in a similar light as Ronda Rousey, meaning that, you know, after their losses, they just they they just they're just their time is over. And I know your perception of him and your opinion of him wouldn't change mine either, but you know, it's obviously not going to take away from the accolades, but I'm just saying maybe in the public, in the public eye, because Ronda Rousey is seen differently. And I'm wondering if, like, say, if, if he lost to Cowboy, he would be seen differently from now on, like he doesn't have it anymore or something. And also, if he were to lose, where do you think Connor would go from here? Because I think you, we have an idea of where he would go if he won. You know, he has a couple of options. But what do you think he would do if he lost? Just want to get your thoughts on that. Thanks, bro. Only for the short term. I mean, look, if, if you were to get defeated in a martial arts contest, yes, there can be a little bit of money lost and some uh, prestige and some ego. That can all go away. But it's kind of the other way, too. Even if everything is going your way, well, then you get another contract with another opponent. You have to relook at everything. Does the world think you could beat that guy or that one's a little bit too tough? Look, there really is no great way to go, but I will tell you, is short-lived. The accolades are short-lived, and they feel good when they happen, but it's a short high. And like anything in life, what goes up must come down. But that can only get so low, too, right? I mean, it is competition. It is sport, after all. The bottom line is why you're doing it is to play a game. And the reason you play a game is to have some fun. Hi, Chill. My name is Bo, coming from Santa Maria, California. I am a huge Khabib fan, and... I I heard what Khabib said about, you know, Connor having to fight 10, 20 some odd times before deserving a rematch with him. And I think that that statement's a little outlandish. However, I do understand that Connor got smashed in that fight. It wasn't exactly close. Why would you rematch a fight where it was just it was pretty much domination? I mean, whatever he lost one round to Connor, it wasn't a whatever. You know, it was he smashed Connor. So why would you rematch that? Other, anyway. Also, I really Khabib didn't say this, but I can understand how he might feel this way. Is that I don't think that that was fun for him. That wasn't a fun process to go through with Connor and his team, and everything. Uh, as a as a viewer, that wasn't fun to watch. Khabib go through that. It wasn't fun to watch, to listen to what Connor said about Khabib and his religion and his family and his culture that wasn't fun and I wouldn't want to see that happen again and I don't think Khabib wants to do that again and if Dana White really 
really tries to put this fight together. If Khabib says no, what happens? Well, you're saying a lot of things there. I certainly won't tell you what you need to find fun and entertaining. And I think that you are right to say that Khabib didn't enjoy all of that. I mean, I can't even remember a press conference uh, where Khabib, it was supposed to start at four o'clock. Khabib showed up at four. Connor wasn't there yet. Schedule, it was scheduled for four to 4.30. At 4.30, Khabib got up and left and Connor hadn't even arrived to the arena yet. I think that that was a little bit of a weight off of Khabib's shoulders because all he's going to do is sit there and get ridiculed for 30 minutes anyway. Which adds to your point that it wasn't fun. I, I, I think that you're right that he didn't enjoy it. I will tell you, though, you said one thing that surprised me is when you said that Connor got smashed and that fight wasn't competitive. That's Connor did get smashed. He did get smashed. But Connor did some smashing. And that fight really was closer than a lot of people remember. Connor, even right in the first 25 seconds, right in the open of the ring, Khabib's in on his shot. And this was really telling. If Khabib can't get Connor down, oh boy. Maybe this is the end of Khabib's run. If Connor can sprawl and get away, maybe the night is going to go for Connor. It's a very telling moment. Connor ultimately did get taken down. But boy, he made Khabib work for it. I mean, it was a very compelling, and it, in large part was a turning point in that fight, even though it was the first 25 seconds in. Yeah, sure, that, that changed the fight and began to even be the story of the fight. The only time Connor could get back to his feet is when rounds would end and the referee was forced to let him up. But if you go back and watch that, if you watch some of those scrambles, all the scrambles and all the tussles were won by Khabib. They all went Khabib's way, but they were hard, and they were close, and they were competitive. Then you have the round that Connor won, which represents the one and only round Khabib's ever lost. I just think that that fight was a little bit closer in the X's and O's. And I also think that there are a couple of things. If you go look at what Khabib did so well, he was able to wash and repeat, wash and repeat over and over again. And it does seem to me that Connor, now having been in there and felt that, will come away with a little bit better idea of how to deal with it in, in the future. That's not enough maybe to make believe that uh, he's going to go down. But I do think that you need to, at some point, look at the rankings. I think at some point you do have to give a respect to the rankings. And Connor is ranked very high. And if Connor comes back and gets a win over Cap, I mean, look, this isn't the craziest thing that we've ever heard. I think that it is less crazy to say that Connor with a win over Cowboy is going to fight Khabib. I think that's a less crazy statement than saying Connor needs 10 more victories to get to Khabib. I think they both seem like we're stretching a little bit here. And between the two, a win over Cowboy Get You Khabib is a lot more fair of a statement than go beat 10 guys and see me then. Hey, Chael. So in a recent uh, podcast, I heard Luke Thomas uh, allude to the fact that Conor McGregor's left hand is uh, quite powerful and could possibly, with three or four shots, knock out anyone except the heavyweight. Uh, so this leads me to ask you... Do you think it's possible for Conor McGregor in a street fight, does he have a fighter's chance against someone like John Jones? Could his left hand knock out John Jones? Or am I just talking crazy? Oh, that's a tough one because you threw in the term street fight. So now I'm, I'm having to wonder, do they know they're fighting? I mean, is he coming up and sucker punching? John Jones, look, if John turned and faced him and then somebody said go, whether you were doing it in the street or the ring or not, John would be just too much for him. To the point of, does Connor have a very fast and very deadly left hand that most guys get wobbled from, particularly guys his size? Yes. Oh, it's an incredible tool, and he can throw it at such incredible distance. I think he throws it his best as a counter. When I see Connor throw that left, and it really is on the mark, it's when somebody throws at him, Connor slips, boom, and comes back and answers. That's a, any setup that Connor has, that's the one I feel he generates the most power from. Hey, Uncle Chael. Many commentators of the sport and many athletes that have been in the sport of mixed martial arts all agree that jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, is the number one martial art that you need proficiency in to be able to translate into cage fighting. With that being said, is no gi jiu-jitsu more important than gi jiu-jitsu? Are the gis just kind of the grips that you have to learn, the grabbing inside the lapel, grabbing the wrist, four-finger grips, stuff like that to be able to gain leverage, are those kind of just smoke and mirrors? Do you really need that? Or would you more want to be proficient in no gi jiu-jitsu, whereas, you know, when you're going inside of a cage, of course, we're daggone near butt naked. 
So wouldn't no gi jujitsu translate better into cage fighting? I like your reasoning there. I happen to agree with it. And it would be very tough to say that jujitsu wasn't the most important art, right? I mean, if you were to go into a cage fight in a mixed martial arts and have no understanding of jujitsu, you're probably in the wrong sport. And there is probably some other arts where you could have little to no understanding and still get away with it inside of a cage. Uh, so in, in that regard, I think that your point is fair that it is jujitsu. Now, when you're asking specifically about the training, it's a whole nother sport, gi, jujitsu. It really is. If you ever go and train with a gi on, you're learning a different sport. A lot of because of the grabs, because of the holds, because of some of the passes. No gi, jujitsu is slipperier. It is a little bit wetter. It is a little bit harder to secure positions because you can't just reach up and grab a hold of the lapel. And in that way, does translate, at least in theory, I think also in practice, but at least in theory, it does translate a little bit better to mixed martial arts. Even when you have some, some players who are very loyal to judo, and so they claim, oh, my skills are all from judo. They don't really train much in the gi because there's no gi in the ring. Or if you have a fighter that's very loyal to Sambo and he just claims, you know, I'm a, I'm a Sambo practitioner. If you go watch him training, he's not training in the, in the Sambo jacket. Because again, to your point, that's just not what you're going to see under the lights on Saturday night. So in that regard, yes, it is very realistic and a very much more realistic feel to have a no gi when you're practicing jujitsu, hoping to carry that you over to martial art. What's up, Uncle Chell? This is David from Buffalo, New York. So everybody say retired MMA fighters should be judges, but don't you think some of those retired MMA fighters would be biased to the style of fighting that they used to perform? Thanks. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't. I've never loved this whole uh, the fighters should. I've just heard too too many fighters talk. Right, the fighters. A judge has to be a former fighter. However. Tripping on my words here. You know what I'm trying? I do get frustrated because I do hear fighters say that. I know so many fighters that are very well respected, but they will maintain that they can win a fight inside their guard. It's like, no, excuse me. You can't, unless you finish your opponent, you're not going to win the round being in your guard. The guard is designed as a defensive position, but you'll have very respected fighters that believe that they can through a strategy. Or they'll even try to argue, well, he didn't do anything to me. Okay, great, but if he didn't do anything to you and you didn't submit, submit him and all things are equal, you're on bottom, you're losing, just by example. Then there's other fighters, and I've heard them talk about this, that, hey, no judges give enough credit to leg kicks. They were kickboxers themselves. They know the power. They know the efficiency. They know how hard it is, timing-wise, reach-wise, the damage that it can do to run your shin into your opponent's thigh. But if you're out there giving too much credit to that, I heard one guy even say that he wouldn't score takedowns equally if it was a wrestler versus a kickboxer. Oh, and by the way, the guy that told me this is a sitting judge. A sitting judge was the sitting referee of a fight that I had and said, if I was judging this and it's a wrestler versus a kickboxer and the kickboxer took the wrestler down, I'm going to give that a lot more credit because I know that's not where the wrestler wants to be and I know that's not what the kickboxer is good at. I remember being a young guy in the rules meeting, looking around going, no, that's not, that's not true. Everything is scored equal. A takedown is a takedown, no matter who does it. It does not matter. If, if you're a really good boxer and a non-good boxer comes out and, and busts you in the nose with a jab, a jab's a jab. Doesn't matter who threw it. Doesn't matter who did it. So yeah, I think you would really be opening up yourself to a number of problems, a number of problems. If you not only let fighters be judges, if you made the judges all have been fighters. Hey, Chell, Tay here in Houston. Uh, I'm sure by now you've seen that interview with Connor on the Mac Life where he uh, says that Justin Gaethje's on the list. And I'm pretty sure that you started salivating when you heard that. What a great fight. Looks like Connor has really got something out for him. And you know, Justin's been talking that trash. So I'm already getting hyped about this fight and it's not even on the books yet. Just wonder what your thoughts are on Gaethje versus McGregor. I'd love to see Gaethje versus McGregor. Look, there we appear to be a little bit unclear. Gaethje has gone on record saying, I'm not going to fight anybody until I fight for a title. And by the way, I'm even going to go get myself in shape and I'm going to get my weight down. They've tried to do this Khabib Tony thing, you know, four other times and it's always fallen through. If it happens a fifth, I'm going to be ready and I'm going to step in there. This is what Gaethje said. Now, I don't know that we need to hold Gaethje to that. 
Uh, I think that Gaethje can have an emotion and a thought and come and share it. And I don't know that he has to be locked into that. He wasn't under oath. He was just a guy sharing his feelings and emotions. But let's say we are to take him at his word. Then it does make you wonder, well, what if I couldn't give you the title fight, but I could give you Conor McGregor? And I have a feeling Gaethje's going to go, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, great. That, that, that works too. Where do I sign? Connor's in a little bit of a tough spot. I mean, there is a lot of being asked of Connor, a lot being demanded of Connor. Look, here's the bottom line. It's Cowboy versus Connor. And we need to start with that. Everybody keeps coming in trying to get Connor. Nobody ever gets the Connor fight. I mean, it's very rare. How many guys have ever got Connor since connor has been Connor? How many guys have gotten Connor in the last year or even the last meaningful period of time? Zero. None. All right, so right now, it's Cerrone. But guys always miscalculate this, right? They always come out and they look like fools because they do something that everybody else is doing. So now when you're saying things that other people have already said or are saying along with you, it's very hard for your voice to stand out. I won't begrudge anybody who's trying to get the Connor fight. I understand it completely. The smarter man would be putting his money on the fact that Cerrone is going to go and pull an upset. The smarter man would then be pointing his guns at Cerrone. He would be the only voice in the room calling out Donald. Even Donald himself would look around and go, what, you're calling me out? I don't have any heat with you. Yeah, I, you don't have any heat with me, but everybody's calling out this same guy. I'm going to bet the house that you're going to upset him. And when you do, you're going to be looking for something to do. And I'm going to make sure that something is me. That's what the smarter guy would do. Whether it works out or not, we'll see. But that's what the smarter play here is. That is a more likely and more realistic play than being one of the 50 voices all begging Connor, choose me.